Um, because it's probably one of the most complex endeavors in the district. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you want to do less functionality, you can actually speak to him. I do have this thing in 30 minutes. So, but <laughs> so when I look at those five, it's hard to talk about the computer stuff. Mm -hmm. They're now 4G. If you told me when I started that I would get a 4G computer, I'd be like, what room is that going to be? And now it's the thing that started my computer stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention. I'm Rex Watnam, and it's my privilege to welcome you to the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies for uh, an event that we're very proud to host here today on, on uh, cyber futures, particularly as they relate to China. We have one of I think the nations, the world's experts on it, who has authored a tremendous work on the subject, and it helped us highlight the efforts here at the Potomac Institute to study the issues in and around cyber terrorism and cyber technology. Uh, we're very proud here at the Institute to be hosting uh, a Cyber Center, uh, chaired, directed by Ambassador Dave Smith, and under his leadership, we hope over the next couple of years to focus on this topic at some length. For those of you who don't know the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies, we're a not-for-profit think tank here in the Washington area that focuses on science and technology policy. So the issues of cyber, cyber terrorism, cyber warfare, and information warfare are exactly the type of topic that the Potomac Institute is known for. I'd like to welcome and recognize Chairman of our Board of Regents, General Al Gray, and a number of our Board of Regents members, like Guy Du Bois and a few others in the audience today, thank you very much for coming and for sharing with us uh, your time and your scholarship. As we like to point out on all of these events, this is the beginning of the discussion. We very much uh, ask for you to participate during question and answer and follow up with us after the event is over. The topic of information warfare is, uh, of course, one that is very topical today, but not at all new. It dates back, in fact, to once again, Sun Tzu, who mentioned the use of information technology and, and convincing an enemy that what he thinks is true isn't, and has been used and exercised over the millennia in a variety of ways. In fact, in 1300, 1400, 1500 Europe, it was common practice to send uh, emissaries to the courts of the other feudal kings and queens to, to spread rumors of how big your army was compared to theirs. Uh, the word of mouth version of information warfare in fact proved to be very, very useful during that time frame and was, was the art of doing it was perfected in many, many ways that are written about well and in fact uh, documented uh, in the court of Henry VIII and led to the uh, many wars and in fact the death of some of his wives. Uh, the invention of the printing press changed that quite a bit and we started to practice information warfare by printing books and leaflets that were skewed in a certain way to drive people in one direction or another. Later on, the invention of radio and TV gave us a tool in information warfare that really characterized late World War I and all the way into World War II. Some of you will, at least the old ones in the crowd, will remember uh, Tokyo Rose, uh, Hanoi Hannah, uh, and in fact, on our side, Radio Free Europe, Voice of America, and uh, TV Cuba, which we've, we've had some, some effect as well. Now we have the internet age, and things are changing radically. Printing presses are going out of business. TV studios and news, and the character of the spread of news is rapidly changing. What is the role of the internet in the information age of information warfare? Maybe we're back to the future in that word of mouth is now tweets and blogs, and emails and text messages and the power of from one person's ear to another is back but in a new way instead of at the speed of people walking across Europe to spread rumor it's at the speed of light of one person whispering into another's ear how this technology will change warfare and the, the future of mankind is the subject of today's meeting and many more like it that we've charged Ambassador Smith to explore over the next uh, 
several months, and we ask you to participate with us in that scholarship. So once again, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for participating. And we ask that, uh, as I said a minute ago, you'll treat this as just the beginning of the discussion. I'd like now to introduce Ambassador David Smith, who has graciously agreed to give his entire life to the effort at Potomac Institute <laughs> running a cyber center. And today we'll uh, host the meeting and uh, the tr tremendous presentation of the schedule. Ambassador? Mike, thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule to come and uh, welcome everybody. And uh, on, on behalf of the entire institute, I'd like to thank all of you uh, from my side for coming. Uh, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, this Potomac Institute Cyber Center is literally just exactly three months old. And uh, we've uh, done a lot of things here. We've had uh, Russian cyber capabilities um, uh, briefing that's been done here and taken to various organizations around town. Uh, we've had a few things published. We have a blog site. We have a Twitter account. We're doing a lot of interesting things. And uh, it just occurred to us that having started the thing with the, uh, the Russian cyber capabilities, the other uh, major issue for the United States to take a look at, as far as at least as a nation state threat, uh, was to take a look at China. So fortunately, we had uh, a friend of mine who just, here we'll show off his book, just published uh, literally, what, three, four months ago, uh, this uh, book came out. So I thought it would be nice if we asked Bill to come and um, uh, give us a sense of what's in the book. Uh, obviously, he can't do it justice, because I have also told him he's got 30 minutes. Um, but uh, he has quite a little show for us. And then we're also very, very lucky that we have uh, two of the uh, real uh, stars in the field here. We have James Mulvenon uh, and Mark Stokes with us. Uh, so uh, this is really a stellar lineup that we have with these three people. I have volunteered to say a few words at the end of the thing, uh, but I, I, I don't really belong at the table with these, uh, with, with these people. Um, uh, Mark may not remember, but he was a, an Air Force officer uh, in the Pentagon when I was just starting to try and learn some of this stuff. And actually, was Air Force, right? Air Force, yeah. Yeah, OK. And uh, uh, he was gracious enough to uh, give me some of his time. And I, he doesn't believe me, but I still have a manuscript of your first book. Uh, it's still sitting on my desk in printed out form, big, thick thing there that you uh, shared with me pre-publication at the time. So, and I still have it. So um, thank you very much. Uh, James Mulvenon, of course, has been around uh, the world of uh, uh, Chinese security issues for many, many years. Uh, he also probably doesn't remember, he and I sat on many panels back into missile when I was doing missile defense, and we were looking at Chinese missile development. Um, and that was a long time ago, right? but nonetheless. So um, uh, we're, also, we're very pleased to have him. So what we'll do here uh, today is um, uh, we'll go ahead and listen to, to Bill uh, for about 30 minutes on, uh, on his presentation. And then uh, we'll have uh, some commentary uh, from James, from Mark, from myself, open it up to Q&A. Uh, and we do, as Mike said, uh, very much um, hope everybody will participate and that you will come to our future events uh, here. Uh, with that, I'd also like to, to thank General Gray, former Commandant of the Marine Corps, and our um, Chairman of our Board of Directors for coming uh, also a very busy day. So um, uh, for also our speakers, uh, you do them great honor. So thank you very much for coming, General. So with I that. To, I used to work for him, so what? Uh, <laughs> okay. um, so uh, Bill, with that, I'm going to ask you to uh, uh, go ahead and start. And we'll part the waters here so uh, Bill's presentation isn't coming into our faces instead of the screen. Bill? Thank you, Ambassador. I appreciate that. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you've heard my introduction. Uh, but before we get started, <coughs> a couple of uh, requests of you in the audience. Um, as I go through this, if I say anything outside of my initial soliloquy that you don't understand, please stop and ask me questions. Likewise, if I use an acronym that you're not familiar with, stop and say, Bill, I don't know what you're talking about. And I know that my last request would be honored by these gentlemen here. If I say something that you want to challenge, please do that, because I do not have all the answers. This is just my interpretation and really the fundamentals of, of transformation warfare. But before we begin, you can look right there, please. Okay. When you think of China from this point forward, there's two characters that I want you to always remember and never forget. And if you've seen these before, you're going to laugh. But if you haven't, then I want you to really understand and realize this. 
So there's two characters that make up China. The top one is Zhong, and the middle one is, the bottom one is Guo, Middle Kingdom. This is the king surrounded by the land that he encompasses. And the point of that is everything that China does is focused on China. And you need to understand that when you approach this particular subject. It's not about technology, it's not about language, it's not about history, it's not about economics or politics. It's about all of these things combined. So without further ado, let's, let's hop right into this. So you know, Ambassador Smith has introduced my book, a little bit of self-promotion, that'll end that. But it is available on Amazon. And uh, I do have, for those of you that are here in the audience, if you go to my website, you can get it at a, at a discount. I'll send it to you autographed. So here's the basic itinerary agenda for this morning, this afternoon. I'm going to take a look at these seven things. As I mentioned before, if you have a question as we go through this, please do not be shy. And I know that General Gray and others in the audience will not be shy. Please ask questions as we go through this. I want it to be an open discussion. You will also note that this is going to be a military presentation style, but I do not want it to be death by PowerPoint. Please. <laughs> All right. So master of this domain, I have to give credit where credit is due, and I mean that genuinely. Mr. Or Timothy Thomas is not here, but these two gentlemen here, I have to give credit. Mr. Stokes? Well, thank you for Thank you, sir. Mr. Well, thank you very much. I could not have done it without these three, and certainly Ambassador Smith and his <laughs> inspiration here. But yeah. gentlemen, credit where credit is due. You are my idols in this space. I am just a mere passing student as we go through this. Well, now I can pull my pirate. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's the 100 page one. I bought it in China. <laughs> so one of the things I always do pride myself on as I speak internationally is the fact that you always have to take a look at current events. And I'm not going to read these slides, but I want you to take a look at these because that's really the beauty of this particular space. People ask me, so Bill, how do you keep up with this? And I say, well, do you mean Minute by minute, do you mean hour by hour, do you mean day by day, do you mean month by month? Really, it is having a passion and taking a look at this. And I hope by the end of this presentation that you have an idea of how current and rapid these events are developing. Who's heard of Hanyuan? Yeah, that's a big deal. What's really unique about this particular issue is it's gone from the physical world to the cyber world, between the Philippines and the People's Republic of China. Historically, if you look back at the Hanyuan incident, China does have claim over this, and the Philippines are, are starting to rattle their sabers by getting somebody like Anonymous to help them fight their cyber war, because they do not have the capability. But the really unique thing, as you'll see towards the end of this presentation, there is no attribution of the People's Republic of China, the government, is there? So here are the rules of engagement. Nothing is what it appears. Isn't that a beautifully Chinese thing? You already know what Zhongguo means. China has a military which indeed controls everything. And economically, they are capitalist, but politically, they are communist. And until that regime changes, that's the way it's going to be in the Middle Kingdom. And any presentation on China would not be complete without Sun Tzu. So there's your, your gratis Sun Tzu. Thank you, General Gray. Mandarin Chinese is an e easy language, believe it or not. If somebody like me from Minnesota can learn it, it can be done. But it is also a brilliant cryptography, and that'll be important later on in the presentation. I'm not going to speak to the last two, but or the seventh one, but numerology is indeed important in, in China. And if you've never seen that before, you really need to pay attention to that. So I've already explained that China is indeed the center of the earth, according to them, and they want to control everything as it relates to that. One important thing, some of you are probably asking, is this a China bashing seminar? Not at all. In fact, I really do love China but there are some aspects of their military and their government that you need to be aware of as it relates to cyber warfare. So who is China? Well, indeed, you've got the Communist Party, you've got the state, and you've got the military. Who here has seen this uh, NGC report? This really talks, yes, you probably have contributed to it. I'll pass it around, but this basically gives you, indeed, the, the bluff from the bottom line up front in terms of what not only the communist government, the military, universities and state-owned enterprises are doing as it relates to capturing the information high ground preparatory to conflict. And they know kinetically that they're not going to be able to do that with their traditional forces on the ground. And if you look historically back through history, and we'll see in a second, they do not want that to happen in the cyber realm. So they're going to take first position and advantage and make sure that they are not dominated as they have been historically. 
So Chinese methodology, certainly some of you that are more technical in the room have seen this, but this is indeed really what it comes down to. Servers are put up on the web. Botnets originating from the People's Republic of China crawl them, pinging them, looking for different types of activity, functionality, and purpose. Now this is just my little position in Minnesota. Imagine if you're a multinational or a government or an intelligence organization. They're doing the same thing in your organization as well. So what's the motivation? Well, it's fear of Weibo Ren, foreigners, with the exception of a couple in the room. Every one of us is considered to be foreign by the Chinese. Of course, that's also self-preservation, as I mentioned. And historically, if you look at what has happened in China, they have been invaded physically since the Mongols all throughout history. And they do not, as I mentioned before, want that to happen now in the cyber realm. And they know they don't have the military yet to do this. And of course, the perfect description of the Communist Party is controlling everything within Chinese society, including religion. One question I have here that maybe this audience will laugh at, how does a dissident who's blind escape Chinese police custody? I don't understand that. And of course, China Netsians, um, the disaffected youth that are there, I believe within uh, five to 10 years, you're going to see a regime change, because they're going to get sick and tired of it. Information warfare, Mao Zedong, you have to have that. But what's really interesting, I'm going to read this verbatim. To achieve victory from the Chinese perspective, must as far as possible make the enemy blind and deaf by sealing his eyes and ears and drive his commanders to distraction. This was written in the 40s. This applies today in the 21st century. And of course, 2010 was a landmark year for the, China, for the US military because US Cyber Command came out and announced that they're going to indeed stand up a component command that's going to be responsible for that fifth generation or information warfare. Guess what President Hu Jintao said later that year in 2010? You're going to do the same thing in order to protect our infrastructure as Chinese from against all enemies, both foreign and domestic. And he gathered his general staff directorate, these five princelings as they're called, or these generals, and said, I want you to create this information warfare capability for us. What's interesting about these folks here, and General Gray, with all due respect, they all have technical backgrounds, have commanded troops, and understand how to use a network to attack through computer network operations. US military, we don't have that capability. These are all research scientists and have also commanded troops in the field. That's a dangerous combination when it comes to formulating a battle plan. If I even scared you so far, these two gents right here will really scare you. They represent the military at the educational level. And they basically said that their goal as a Chinese military is to achieve that strategic objective. And if you don't meet their conditions, they will topple your government until you meet their political conditions. Wow, that sounds a lot like what's happening in Hanyuan down in the Philippines, doesn't it? Has anyone seen this before? information assurance base. This is their table of organization. So they put a lot of thought into this. What's really unique about this, it's not only the military, but more importantly, President Hu Jintao, in terms of a political angle, helps formulate policy and position, as you heard by their stand-up other information command. I'm sure you've all seen this, according to Richard Clark in his book, Cyber War. Indeed, policy of information dominance and the precision attack vectors that they will carry out. Now, well, you'll notice that this is the first time you're going to start to see anything that is technical in orientation. And of course, as we all know, in the technical world, these things will lapse and eclipse each other in the space of even a day. But you can see by looking at some of these, they're very familiar. Who has seen this or heard of unrestricted warfare? A few of you. What is it, sir? Unrestricted warfare? Um, it's a lot of things, but probably the most important is that if out in response to Desert Storm and basically says that because of the military capabilities of the United States conventional forces, they would take any and all means to respond and even civilians would be targets. Yes, sir. Very good. Thank you. What's really unique about this is you could take any soldier in the People's Liberation Army, Navy, or Air Force, put them in front of a GUI interface that can attack IP addresses with this particular command and statement of how we're going to conduct war, and they'd be successful against an adversary. Who heard of the uh, University of Alabama at Birmingham attacks on CCTV7? And what happened there? What's interesting about that is the graphic on Chinese military TV showed a 10-year-old tool 
graphical user interface of picking an IP address and hammering it, trying to defeat it or deny its service. What's really scary about that is that video came out about two years ago. What's really frightening about it is it was gooey in the fact that they could take any soldier in the military in China and have them sit down. Now, if you think about an economy of force, that's pretty daunting. Have them sit down at a computer terminal, anywhere that they can access the internet, and hammer away at an adversary. So I'll tell you more about these Chinese hackers. As I mentioned, the Communist Party said we're going to do this in response to the American Cyber Command. Who here has heard of President, uh, or sorry, that was a Freudian slip, Xi Jinping? Well, who is he, sir, briefly? Absolutely, and you know what the history is behind this gentleman? He was re-educated in the Communist Party view. He was too radical. So they sent him back to re-education camp and said, you need to tone it down a little bit because we're not quite ready for that, uh, that point of view from a Communist Party perspective. What's really frightening, though, is he understands and appreciates technology in the way that the military, educational and academic institutions, as well as state-owned enterprises can be leveraged to formulate power. And that's where you get this information and technology support, uh, superiority. The PLA, they literally wrote the book on warfare, Sun Tzu, right? If you've met, how many of you have a copy of Sun Tzu's Art of War? Some of you probably have it in corporate. That's good. I know General Gray does. Who's heard of Sun Ping and his military methods, his, grand, his great grandson? Wow. In this audience, no one has? General Gray, I know you have. If you think Sun Tzu is effective, you ought to read his grandson, great grandson. Seriously. He takes what Sun Tzu wrote as a treatise for conducting warfare, both kinetically, symmetrically, and asymmetrically, and it brings it to a very fine point. And these personalities here, Major General Wang Pufang in 95, along with the authors of War Without Limits, otherwise known as Unrestricted Warfare, and Major General Dai Ching Min, started to formulate the combination of traditional warfare and the use of technology in order to defeat an enemy. Again, this is based historically on what has happened to them as a culture and as a nation. State-owned enterprises, I'm sure you've all in this room have heard of Huawei or ZTE, hopefully. Some of these other state-owned enterprises up here, as you can see, Sinochem and the pharmaceutical companies, all have a need to feed innovation within the People's Republic of China. And if organically they don't have that intellectual property, what do they do? They put in a request for information, an RFI. It goes back through the PLA, and it comes back with what they're looking for. Activists. One question before I go down this slide. Who's heard of the Golden Shield Project? One, two, that's it? Joan Gray, I know you have. That's also known as the Great Firewall of China. My question is, and some of you riddle me this, please, because I'm just a dumb Norwegian from Minnesota. If hacktivists and most Chinese Netsians cannot get to the same internet that we can in the US, how are they able to get out and attack Taiwan and punish Japan for war crimes of World War II? or hold a web company who has posted anti-rhetoric about China? How do they do that unless it's state-sponsored? Right? I mean, somebody challenge me on that, please. What? Yes, sir, pardon me. You can set up a proxy and operate out. Oh, absolutely. Use a proxy avoidance, a VPN. You've been to China recently then, yes? Well, yeah. Make a proxy is a good one, by the way. Yes, sir. I think you're confusing geography for political organizations. So those people don't necessarily have to be physically in that country, correct? No, sir, that is correct. All right. Yes, sir, thank you. That's a good point. The gentleman's comment is they are not in these countries. They're actually in China, pushing the nationalism and the sense of history of China against Taiwan, who is that renegade province. Who's ever configured a tipping point appliance from HP? Anyone? When you go through the command line, guess what it says about all the countries? The, the correct description gets down to, Ren uh, to Taiwan, and it says province of China. I kid you not, I can't make this stuff up. And then Codera was a web hosting company. They had one customer out of all of those web servers that put something anti-Chinese in its rhetoric on that web server. Hacktivists from China, whoops, went in and took down the entire web farm. So if your company was hosted there, or your institute, or your organization, it was brought down by these Chinese hacktivists. Who here has seen this? Please, I know these gentlemen certainly have. No one? Oh, oh goodness. Well, this is the Chinese version of SC Magazine. It's a computer magazine there in China. It was in Berlin this past fall when I discovered this prior to one of my workshops. This is a combination of articles in response to what they view as the threat 
and the threat is from one country in particular, the United States. They're extremely afraid of us as Chinese. And a combination of military, academics, and other people put together about two dozen articles that said, this is how we need to protect ourselves from a nationalistic sense against attacks from the United States. As I read through some of these operations, can I see a show of hands who have seen this? I did this in St. Paul two days ago, and the room was completely aghast at some of these operations. Uh, Titan Rain, if you've heard of it, raise your hand. The Byzantine Hades, Ghost Nail, oh, good. I would expect that in this audience. Operation Aurora, Night Dragon. Who's seen this particular publication from our Federal Bureau of Investigation? If you haven't seen it, it's, a, it's available on the web. Send me an email, I'll send you the PDF. Or you get a physical copy from your local FBI agent. Operation Shady Rat. And then, of course, that NGC report that's going around. Who saw this in January of this year, Popular Science? Awesome article. This actually gives a great synopsis of Chinese information warfare. I can pass this around to you if you'd like to see it, or you can come up afterwards. Sir? You're welcome. Conclusions? Well, information warfare is indeed driven by the need for China to remain the middle kingdom. Attribution is difficult, but cyber warfare is something that is indeed state-sponsored. PLA is planning both offensive and defensive cyber warfare capabilities. Number four is particularly important because the histi historical, economical, cultural thread, of course with the ling linguistic, weaves its way through Chinese cyber warfare. Communist Party, although they advocate citizen hacking because it helps promote the Communist Party, they can no longer control it. Who's heard of the Nortel case study and what happened there? Well, there's a couple of companies called ZTE and Huawei that suddenly became telecommunications giants about the end of Nortel's history, wasn't it, sir? And Nortel basically had a remote access tool on their network exfiltrating their corporate and intellectual property for about 10 years before it was discovered. Which leads me to number seven. Chinese written malware, remote access tools, and botnets are undiscoverable. Somebody in this room, please correct me if that's wrong. Sir? It's wrong. It is. Why? You just have to know what you're looking for. Ah, you're looking for. I have no idea what you're looking for. Oh, yes, yes. Mandarin Chinese, both the complex and the simple versions, are an exceptional form of cryptography. Right. Not to mention classical or literary Chinese. And if you can speak all those with effect and impact, you make a million dollars every day. All commercial intrusion prevention systems are ineffective against Chinese-based attacks. Somebody please challenge me on that as well. Please, why? Well, because despite us not understanding Chinese, we should code code. And if you understand what the network traffic looks like, yes. Yes, sir, I would agree with you. However, if I go back a couple slides to the history, why were some of these remote access tools as executables planted on these networks and not discovered for months to years? Just a couple reasons. Please. Most of these companies just don't know the signatures are up for because you classify the crap out of everything. The second reason is once they get into the network, they're going to drop a variety of different remote access tools all over your network so that you don't know. If you find one, there's still going to be 10 others. And they'll start seeing you do mediation. So if you detect one, mm -hmm. and they see you drop that host offline, they're immediately going to route around you and start dropping other tools on your network because they still have backdoors. Well, I agree with you, but then shouldn't we be learning from that? Well, we are. Slowly. But why are these attacks still happening? Because there's, I don't know how many of them are, but there's a ton of them out there, and they're every day. I mean, I'm looking at one right now. Thank you. So they are advanced, they're persistent, and they're a threat, yes? Absolutely persistent. Yes. Absolutely a threat. Many of them are advanced. Yes. And the ones and zeros, you're right, in terms of executables are indeed code. Yes. But if the executable code is not detected by a commercial IPS who writes the same heuristic or anomaly based signatures. I would agree with you that yeah. commercial Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir, please. Go ahead. So I think it's more nuanced than that, and I, I don't know about the attribution completely, but there are effective and ineffective techniques, and the ones that last long are the effective ones. So it's like it's not, they don't build them like they used to because the only things that are standing are good. There are lots of attacks that are ineffective, but they are on that list because they're ineffective. Yes. So I think you need to gradiate it. You can't say all commercial IPSs are ineffective against all attacks. 
there are some that are effective against and some that aren't. Absolutely, you are correct. Absolutely. Number 10, cyber warfare threat from China is serious and it's only going to get worse to your point. Yes? I don't know, I guess. I, it's hard to predict the future. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not predicting the future, but every day I pull up the web and look at my feeds, it's China's attacking or hacking this, they're exfiltrated this, another company has gone down and lost IP. <laughs> Number 11, and you're going to really hate this from a Marine, and John Gray, I apologize, but maybe diplomacy in combination with the show of military force in Asia is probably going to be the only option. And what happened to those 9,000 Marines that are, no, are homeless from Okinawa? And what about that regiment that went to Australia? I couldn't agree with you more. Ross, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. Short and long-term moves. Uh, hopefully the Institute will make this available. I don't want to go through it in depth, but this gives you an idea. If you take a look at not only corporate responsibility, government, at all levels, from tactical, operational, strategic, I think we can work with the Chinese in order to defeat this problem. Here are my references. Lieutenant Colonel Timothy Thomas, the two gentlemen to your front, left, my right, left, your right. These gentlemen are indeed the, the um, um, impetus behind what I've done here. Credit goes where it's due. Of course, one last plug for my book. May I? May I? Yes, please. Question. Please, what on you? May Oh, sorry. Yes, sir. John. You want to mention uh, the fact that uh, it's not just the PLA per se doing this. That that there are a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, Chinese kids, and civilians, and everybody else has been recruited by them. So it's uh, it's got a kind of a force multiplier kind of capability, which we don't talk about much. Yes, sir, and that's why at the beginning of the slide it is fundamentals. Um, these gentlemen can speak much greater volumes than I can. I've tried to do justice in my book, but you're right, General. A force multiplying capability and effect of civilian hackers, state-owned enterprises who need the exfiltrated intellectual property to the Chinese government who needs to know what we're doing strategically. They're going to look for We also support. don't want to uh, shell Taiwan down the river. They've got a little bit of capability, too. And uh, they, they, of course, speak the same language, <laughs> all the dialects. And, and uh, you know, everybody worries about uh, uh, China taking Taiwan. You know, if they ever take Taiwan, Taiwan will probably be running them in about five years. I mean, they got all the entrepreneurial capabilities. About must be a million of them around Shanghai right now. So it's uh, you know, it's not as uh, cut and dried as it always looks. You're, you're correct, John. Yes, sir. Well, uh, another area I would I would add to that mix is the research institutes in China. Yes. When we peeled back the ASAT capability in China, uh, what we found was the government had very little capability. What they did was they linked into these four or five research institutes that were feeding the government uh, with, with, the, with the technology that they were acquiring through nefarious means. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at it from an open source perspective, and trust me, I've been in that credential classify everything world, which is another issue, but there is so much open source information in terms of in Chinese, on the open source research institutions that will give you, and if anybody wants it, they will give you their period of instruction on how they train PLA soldiers. Has anyone in the room seen that before? Hopefully somebody has seen it and you just don't want to admit it. You've seen it because you just alluded to it. Wow. Well, send me an email I'll make sure you get it. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, but we're a PC here, yes. This is America, the melting pot. This is an issue. Yeah. 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 What, 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 what I just said was, China's our friend, not our enemy. They are, really. The one thing I didn't give you is my opening soliloquy, but having studied Chinese since I was 17, and I would never claim fluency, because the first person is Caucasian or non-Chinese that claims fluency in a language other than their mother tongue, is lying to you, period. Look me in my eyes when I tell you that. I would never say I'm fluent. I'm not very good. Uh, hi. Maybe, are there any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Yes, sir, please, sorry. You haven't talked much about US defense capabilities vice the Chinese. That's um, correct. We 
don't seem to have yet figured out the basic uh, responsibilities as to who is doing what. Well, how much is that affecting <laughs> our inability to? Yes, sir. I'm laughing with you. So I'll give you a couple of examples without perjuring myself or embarrassing anyone in the room. But when I'm in an international conference and somebody from a component command says they don't and they cannot define the area of operations, that's the biggest mistake when I've gone to war, is I need to know where I'm taking my Marines, who's our adversary, and how do we defeat them with what particular weapon systems. That does not exist here. I, I haven't seen it yet. Somebody please challenge me on that. As you look up here, I highlighted these as the average PLA soldier being able to take these along with an explanation briefly of Richard Clark's weapons and attack an adversary. I've seen the 24th Air Force's period of instruction for career development for cyber warriors, so I know it exists, but we don't necessarily have cyber rules of engagement. If I were a Marine and an MOS as a cyber warrior, I'd be asking, where's the AO? Where are you going to send me? Are you going to fly the network? No, you're not. Fly what network? You need to physically and ones and zeros to take that network fight to the enemy. And I don't know that that capability exists. Well, Somebody from DOD, please correct me. Uh, it's not as uh, grim as you point out, but I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Trust me. Thank you, General. Why should I? <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, you haven't mentioned anything about uh, the Chinese war games and the use of modeling and simulation. Uh, what are they doing in those areas? Thank you, sir. I have not. Perhaps we could leave that for for the discussion to answer that question. Would that be appropriate? Absolutely. Thank you. Great question. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, there's an old saying, um, people who live in glass houses should not throw rocks. So your presentation has um, uh, listed out the Chinese capabilities, the strategy, and perspectives. I just wondered, could you say a little bit about what are their fears? Uh, we know, for example, um, by their, uh, their work with the Russians and a couple of other authoritarian states in the UN, they fear content on the internet. They fear ideas, they fear the free flow of information. In fact, they're in mortal fear of that. Um, and should such information be flowing, perhaps that timetable for the stability of their government could be, uh, uh, their de de uh, destabilization of their government could be accelerated. So could you just say a little bit yes, about from their perspective, what is it that they are most worried about as they, for themselves, as they look out at this capability? Absolutely. Good, good question, sir. The, the Chinese, besides fearing foreigners and the fact that they do not want to be invaded again, is the fact that they're afraid that the technology that gets into the wrong hands within China and they're somehow able to violate consistently and coherently that Golden Shield project, it's going to bring down the regime. And we're starting to see this. Um, Who here has heard of the Green Dam project? And, and somebody briefly tell me what that was. It was another form of control by the Chinese government. So whenever you bought a, a laptop or a PC, it had software pre-installed on it. So if you search something, even in a Word document, of something that was anti-Communist Party or anti-Chinese, the entire system, the OS, would shut down. Obviously, that didn't work very long, but that's an indication of how silly and how far they take those fears of, of things Western. May I suggest we move on to our conference Absolutely. and then we can do Q&A for the whole thing. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I wonder if I could ask James Mulvenon to, uh, I guess if we turn this off, we can move back into the middle. Oh, sure. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you that one. James, would you mind? No, so we can no. Get it on this Thanks. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for uh, having me here. Um, the. Um, I, I very much enjoyed the last event we did here uh, on a very similar subject with General Hayden. Um, I would just like to put a little bit of categorization and context around the things that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Hagestad said, um, and then talk a bit about the evolution of it, particularly how we've, or how we have, our thinking has changed about what to do about it, and sort of where we are right now, because I, I am involved in a number of, of efforts that we have, both official and unofficial on this front, and I think it's important to talk about the dynamism of how this has changed over time. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my perspective on this is, is multifold. Um, um, uh, like the good Lieutenant Colonel, I often emphasize uh, uh, my language background as a Chinese linguist, for a different reason. Uh, I always start with it because it was so damn hard. 
uh, and it took so long and it destroyed my eyesight. <laughs> um, and, uh, but it, but it, is a, it is a fundamental issue. I, I, I do fundamentally believe one of my iron laws is that the Chinese regard their language as their first layer of defense. It's their first layer of crypto. Um, and one of the interesting contrasts with our Russian friends, um, who are much more paranoid, um, is that the, 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 you know, often people who can read Chinese will see very much and find very much what they want to find um, uh, in plain sight uh, because of that concern about, you know, that lack of concern about, about foreigners being able to read what they write. Um, I've been involved in all five rounds of the uh, cybersecurity dialogue we've had with the Chinese, which has now quickly become the semi-official dialogue and a lot of interesting insights that I'll, I'll try and share with you in a very short time about what we've learned about each other and, and sort of where things stand. And then foremostly as a, as a victim of uh, Chinese cyber espionage, frankly. Uh, I'm also, unfortunately, the CIO and CISO of my company uh, by virtue of the fact that I was the only one who cared. Um, and so I got voluntold to do it. Um, but under relentless assault, in fact, I was sitting back there eating my tuna salad sandwich, reading the, yet another um, output from our uh, uh, net witness machine about the latest uh, intrusion into the system, uh, into finance and accounting, of course. I don't know why those people uh, can't stop uh, screwing around on the internet. Um, the Chinese, if you, I want to look at information a little bit more broadly than I usually do. First of all, at, at the strategic level across the entire Chinese government, you saw on the slides this term informatization or informatization or however you want to call it, Xinxihua. And, and Americans that I, that I talk to about this, it's very difficult for us to wrap our minds around the all-consuming nature of this concept as a matter of national policy. Uh, I mean, there's a state leading group on informatization that is chaired by a Politburo Standing Committee member. And what it really refers to is a belief that information technology uh, applied well across all sectors of national development is a force multiplier uh, for Chinese economic development, Chinese social development, and as the basis for social stability. Uh, and they take this concept very, very seriously. And believe me, they write an enormous amount about it. And the Chinese military <coughs> has a piece of that, of military informatization, that really is the fundamental top line driving strategy and concept in how they are building their C4ISR architecture and their concepts of computer network operations and, and how they're going to integrate information into their uh, efforts to become a, a truly joint military and things along those lines. And the, the early temptation, you know, the Chinese evolve in their writing and thinking. So when you read the early stuff, it's very, you know, very derivative of, you know, Admiral Sabrowski over there on the wall and net-centric warfare. And as they move from the derivative phase, we often then find them adapting these ideas to their actual inventory of equipment and, and their actual doctrinal concepts. And it becomes more Chinese over time. And it actually, you know, so in the beginning, for instance, they would say, um, that you know, they seem to always be two years behind us, for instance. Uh, we adopt the term information warfare two years later, IW shows up in Chinese writing. We move to information operations two years later, IO shows up. We move to computer network operations two years later, CNO shows up in the Chinese lexicon. So they're intensely studying us. In fact, um, one of, you know, uh, it's only slightly flippant to say that a lot of the deforestation problems in the encroaching Gobi Desert on Beijing and all the dust storms is in part due to this obsession the Chinese military has with writing analysis of U.S. military operations uh, since Desert Storm and the, and the entire forests that have been leveled to make the pulp for the books. Uh, that, you know, because you walk into Chinese military bookstores in Beijing and there are literally hundreds and hundreds of different books analyzing U.S. military operations. Um, by the way, just as an interesting contrast, my, con my, my comment about um, China's language being its first line of national defense, there are, by my last count, 29 open Chinese military bookstores in Beijing municipality that you can walk in. Now, of course, there's a room off to the side that has the internal stuff that only Mark has the courage to go in and try and buy. Um, but the, um, uh, that's a different story for a different time. Um, I know of no other, no other capital I have ever visited of a modern state has such availability of its writings on military affairs and doctrine. You go to Taipei, forget it. You know, they, so even, in, yeah, I mean, there's one. But you know, it's not the same. It's not the same prolific nature. You, you know, you come here to Washington. You know, where are the 29 U.S. military bookstores where you can go and read the intimate doctrinal writings 
uh, of, of thinkers in J5 and J8 all over the system. Really? They don't exist. Yet, the, you know, in the Chinese system, we have a tremendous access to the material. The opposite problem, though, is the filter. The vast majority of the books in these bookstores are actually just glossy books written for angry young men on college campuses who want to read about bombs and bullets. And being able to differentiate, and that's where our friends at the Center for Naval Analysis years ago did us a great favor by actually publishing a very thick report that created a methodology for analyzing the authoritativeness of various military publications, which ones are more authoritative than others, and coming up with an entire very, very, very sophisticated metric for figuring out how to do that. Now, of course, as, as was mentioned before, the Chinese system writ large um, had a very mixed opinion about information and the information revolution. Um, they had the advantage of what Gersh and Kron called late modernization, so they, they could avoid some of the mistakes. You know, of course, our internet, as we know it, of course, was created by a bunch of Birkenstock wearing long-haired cyberpunks on the West Coast. I know because when I worked at RAM, they were all still in the basement. Um, and you know, there was this intense, this push-pull that we have in our system of the sort of libertarian sort of initial focus of the system that, you know, and the, the quest for privacy and the, the fact that you say, well, I'm, I'm allowed to be anonymous on the web and I'm allowed to go onto a chat room and talk about how I paint myself blue on the weekends and run around the woods with a bow and arrow and go, I'm an avatar, you know. That's, you know, it's in the Bill of Rights, right, that we're allowed to do that. Well, we're the only country that thinks that. The Europeans certainly don't think that. We, a lot of our conflicts with them on privacy have to do with this very different notion of what is acceptable behavior on the net. So even they're not allies with Secretary Clinton and her internet freedom agenda. And we certainly don't get any comfort from the Iranians or the Saudis or the Chinese or the Russians on these issues. So right from the beginning, the Chinese had this dilemma about connectivity versus security. They knew they needed to be jacked into the global grid um, as a basis of economic development and globalized commerce. At the same time, they knew they were importing and assembling technologies in China that had embedded within them, I hate the word values, um, the modalities of human interaction that potentially represented a fundamental threat to single party rule of the Chinese Communist Party. But I, but I would just wager that most of what you've read about the so-called Great Firewall in your local newspaper um, is actually mythology. Um, that in fact, it's not that they have 50,000 internet police staring at screens or 100,000. The number doesn't even matter. It's much more sophisticated and nuanced than that. They have created an environment of self-deterrence and self-censorship through a layered approach that starts with the gulags and kicking in the door at 4 o'clock in the morning and the jackboot stuff, all the way down to the fact that they have an ISP law that says an internet service provider is responsible for the actions of all of its subscribers. I mean, that's terrifying. For, for, for Fios, that would be terrifying, right? So every dirty, naughty, dark, shameful thing that you do on the internet at 3 o'clock in the morning, your ISP is responsible for that. So naturally, what do they do? They put what are called da mamas, big mamas in the chat rooms to kick you off if you engage in political speech or things like that. In other words, enforcement of the censorship was, was outsourced to the market. That's why it's effective, not because they have 300,000 internet police or 3 million internet police. It's because they've created an environment in which the vast majority of the population says, I'm not going to engage in that kind of behavior that's politically sensitive. And the 0.001% of clove cigarette smoking Beijing University political philosophy students, well, you know what? The security apparatus knows exactly where those guys are. And they're, you know, they know exactly how to control them mainly by cutting off their access to club cigarettes. So, um, so a lot of what you have read, unfortunately, about the Great Firewall, in my view, is, 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 is mythology. Not the least of which is, I would argue, in fact, the Chinese at many different levels, and there's a fascinating project with a collaborator I have at Harvard named Gary King, who's doing a, a wonderful study on near real-time monitoring of Chinese censorship that shows th that the government does not, in fact, censor criticism of the government local government in particular. The Chinese nets are filled with sense of criticism of the government. What they're relentless about is two things. One, they're relentless about deleting criticisms of the censors. People are, very, people are sensitive, you know, they get a little defensive about it. But more importantly, they're absolutely ruthless about people who use these information technology mediums to organize collective action. 
So in fact, getting on the net or listening to the radio or watching television or reading the newspaper in China, by the way, even medium-sized cities in China still have nine thriving newspapers, unlike the United States, where we're all bemoaning the loss of the newspaper, because they're filled with sex and crime. And every sensationalist, yellow journalist thing you could possibly imagine from the 1890s is alive and well in China. So they live in a four-color, full-volume media environment, right? which is why they don't care about VOA. Because you know what? I'm here to tell you. Another mythology is the Chinese people in their hundreds and hundreds of millions are not sitting in their homes yearning to read the Christian Science Monitor. They don't care because they are inundated. They are saturated with media right now. Um, and reading the Christian Science Monitor is not really one of their priorities. At the military level, Dave, just bang on the table when I'm going too long. At the military level, informatization, actually, I read, a, I, I, you know, I'm a Catholic, so I engaged in some uh, masochistic behavior um, a couple of years ago. Um, I read 500 Chinese military articles in informatization, hoping to understand this concept. Uh, and I finally found one that explained it clearly. And you won't be surprised, those of you here in Washington, people in the hinterland don't understand this, but it was a military academic who had to dumb down the concept to explain it to a legislator. Uh, and so, <laughs> and so he, you know, and interestingly, the guy used an example of the A-10 warthog to describe uh, informatization, which I thought was very bizarre. But he said, you know, because I love the A-10 warthog. I mean, who doesn't, right? Um, and he said, it, imagine the A-10 warthog. He said, here's a 45-year-old airframe, um, but with new line replaceable unit, new black boxes, new avionics, things like that. It fights on a modern battlefield. And the Chinese said, well, we have a hybrid force of advanced equipment and lots of advanced equipment. And we've built this very elaborate, sophisticated C4ISR infrastructure. And we're going to use that to network it together to be able, this hybrid force to be able to do swarming and to stay inside the OODA loop of the high-tech enemy with our hybrid force. And that's what they mean by informatization. How do you use sophisticated information and communication technologies to make you fight better against a high-tech adversary uh, that has key vulnerabilities that they've identified. Now, they've, of course, evolved their doctrinal thinking about specifically about cyber issues, but they were incredibly prescient at the beginning. I mean, I was reading Chinese military writings on computer network operations in 1995 and 1996 that were 10 years ahead of our understanding. Uh, and I'll give you one good example. The Chinese military argued uh, that computer network attack was a weapon to be used uh, only as a, a bolt out of the blue preemptive weapon at the opening stage of a conflict, but could not be a force multiplier at every stage of the conflict, like we argue in our doctrinal materials. And their reasoning was, OK, you spend months or years doing passive and active network reconnaissance. You discover the vulnerabilities of the adversary systems. You develop the tools to be able to take advantage of it. And then you strike out of the blue. You know, But what's the blue SOP on our, on our side? You know, what happened to the National War College, I mean, Naval War College, when they got attacked? They took the networks off the grid for two months and went through it with a nip comb looking for Trojans. NDU, offline for two months, going through it with a nip comb. We're getting better about that. Everyone is saying now active defense, fighting through the intrusion, fighting through the attack, you know, all the current buzzwords. We've changed our thinking about that. But what the Chinese are arguing is once you've exhausted that, that list of vulnerabilities, you have to tell the civilian leadership that you now have a very low level of confidence that in real time against a highly alerted adversary who's now 24-7 alerted, has patched the vulnerabilities that you exploited, that you can now find new zero days on the fly that have the same strategic level consequences. You know, I was briefing that for 10 years to people in the DOD cyber community who said, no, 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 we've assured our civilian leaders we're going to have all kinds of capabilities from phase zero all the way to phase five. You know, no degradation in capabilities, doesn't matter if they're alerted. And I think in many ways the Chinese um, had a more sophisticated understanding. But I would argue, without getting into the details of it, um, because I wouldn't last a day in prison, frankly, um, is that what we saw in the first eight years of the intrusion set was really intelligence preparation of the battlefield for a scenario that the Chinese had been, military had been describing in detail since 1996 which was one in which they had analyzed US military operations since Desert Storm and had come looking for the Achilles heel of the high-tech enemy and had come to the conclusion that it was, in fact, the deployment phase, that, our big, that Saddam's biggest mistake was not attacking us during the six-month buildup in Saudi, 
but, but waiting until we had a full force protection package in place. Uh, by then it was too late. We were just going to pick apart his C2 and be done with it. Um, but that in particular, the vulnerability of our deployment phase was our use of unclassified civilian communications backbone. In particular, the fact that we were running, and they got all of this from open source, they just downloaded all the DTIC you know, reports about it, uh, was the fact that we were running all of our automated logistics systems. And my, my favorite acronym in the entire universe, the TIP fiddle, uh, the time phase force deployment list. We were running all of it on Nippernet, and we run all of it on Nippernet to this day. In other words, the logistics infrastructure and the databases that allow these you know, 3,000 page thick tip fiddles to operate so that the tankers are in the right place and everybody's all synchronized and it's all a ballet, uh, is all run on unclassified networks that are connected through gateways to the internet. And they said, that's the key. That we're going to take advantage of what PACOM calls the tyranny of distance in the Pacific and we're going to trip up US military logistics deployments to a Taiwan contingency while simultaneously carrying out kinetic and non-kinetic attacks against the Taiwans. The Taiwans look to the east for the cavalry. The cavalry is not coming quick enough. They capitulate to Beijing with a minimum of fighting. Now, as I've said many times, there are lots of misperceptions embedded in all of this. And, and, and a lot of those misperceptions are important. But what I'm describing, of course, is exactly why we would see an intelligence preparation of the battlefield campaign uh, to be able to exfiltrate so much information from Nipper. And it was like, you know, why are people downloading Nippernet configuration files? I mean, you know, that, you know, Ned and the hackers in the room will tell you that, you know, if it's not about credit card numbers or, you know, things that you can do, you know, you can monetize to impress girls and things like that, hackers are not going to spend their time downloading Nippernet configuration files unless they have a damn good strategic reason for wanting to do it. Um, but the key thing is in the 0506 time frame when that, that um, uh, cyber collection campaign shifted away from .gov, .mil, and classified defense contractor base, which frankly, we have to, let's, let's be, right, let's be you know, accurate about our categories. That is espionage. And in terms of what we can do about it, we can't legislate against espionage. All's fair in love and war at some level, right? But when they escalated and they started attacking companies and stealing uh, intellectual property from the heart of the American innovation economy, to me, that was an escalation in what's going on. And in fact, um, particularly if you read the NCIX report, uh, this was the first time that the uh, National Counterintelligence Executive um, you know, finally came out and said the word China out loud. Um, but in fact, in the last round of the dialogue in December, I remember sitting across from the Chinese side, and they had a very impressive government delegation. And we had all the key players on our side, uh, with the exception of somebody from CyberCom uh, and somebody from the NSS. And, um, and I was one of the designated bad, uh, bad boys, bad person uh, who could say nasty things to the Chinese because I'm not a government official. Uh, and I said, I said, well, I'd like to begin by congratulating the Chinese side on their national achievement. And of course, the Chinese all sat up very straight. And they're like, well, what are you talking about? Is it the Olympics? Is it uh, manned space flight? But I said, no. I said, I wanted to congratulate you. I said, because as a political scientist, you've achieved something I never before thought possible. I'm like, well, what is that? And I said. I said, your intrusion set has been so brazen in its scope and scale and the depth of what you've stolen from you know, Google and Juniper and everybody else that you have actually done something unprecedented in the history of the modern American political system. You have mobilized an all of government response to what you're doing. I said, entire departments that had their heads in the sand that did not even want to be involved in this issue are actually all now all pointed on the same azimuth to try and figure out how we're going to deal with this. And I said, from a political science perspective, that is a tremendous accomplishment. I said, I feel like I need to write to like, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, my, my old professor at UCLA, you know, who recently passed away, um, uh, Mr. Wilson. Uh, I said, I said, I need to write this to him. This defies everything he's written about bureaucracy. Um, <laughs> needless to say, the Chinese side did not take that news very well. Um, <laughs> But this is the big thing is, is that you know, for many years um, in Washington, everyone would say, God, this problem is really, really hard. The attribution problem is so incredibly hard. And I'm, and I'm here to tell you that, you know, that, in fact, attribution is not the bureaucratic unicorn anymore. That even on the outside, you know, um, um, you know stone cold hackers like Ned Moran back there in the corner with whom I work on a regular basis, um, you know, they don't know what the IC calls these intrusion sets, but we know where their command and control networks are. We know their tools they're using. 
And, and keep in mind, it's not that they're that good. Let's not, let's not reify the Chinese. In fact, their tradecraft tends to be pretty sloppy and noisy. Um, it's just that it's not that they're that good. It's that we're that screwed up as a matter of national architecture and everything else. And there are elite Chinese actors that are getting more sophisticated. But you know, it does not take very long for me to find them in my networks. It's just that the piece of crap systems that I've been forced to use by the great Satan, Microsoft, and other people um, are, are so flawed and buggy that I can't keep them out of my networks. Uh, and so you know, let's be clear about that. But attribution is not the bureaucratic unicorn anymore. The bureaucratic unicorn is how do we change China's behavior? And, and how, what examples do we have, particularly from the private sector, of situations in which real IP was exfiltrated? I mean, this is the real unicorn. If you find this one, you will be, you will be rewarded. Um, companies whose IP was exfiltrated by Chinese actors was then distributed to Chinese national champions in that sector, uh, was then converted into Chinese intellectual property, was then taken to market, and then you can demonstrate a demonstrable, measurable loss of US or, or Western multinational market share as a result. So that's where we are now. We're not fighting about attribution anymore. We know where these guys are. We know what they're doing. It's now it's, you know, how can we, in fact, mobilize the parts of the US government, in particular the trade uh, ministries, I call them the ministries, um, and other people who are arguing, no, the overall bilateral relationship is still more important than the cost of these intrusions. So we have, we have an, uh, I'm just, I'll wrap up by just saying we, we have a number of strategic dialogues going. Cyber showed up last week at the strategic, uh, the strategic security dialogue with the Chinese. Not a lot of um, progress. Um, not surprisingly, our demarches of the Chinese have not exactly brought them to their quivering to their knees. Um, we are fighting with them actively now. And in, in the Q&A, we can talk about this in more detail. 2012, in my view, is the year of the debate about cyber sovereignty at the international level. The Chinese put out this international code of conduct with the Russians and the stands last year and are now bringing it to the UN First Committee and the GGE next month. Uh, and their argument is, the internet is far too important to be run by non-state actors like ICANN, um, who they regard as a cat's paw of the Commerce Department, although if they've ever dealt with Esther Dyson or Rod Beckstrom, they wouldn't <laughs> regard ICANN as a cat's paw of anything. Um, so the idea is that you know, we're gonna, they want to change the view which says you know, every router, every switch, every node of the network is within the sovereign boundaries of a nation state and therefore governed by its laws or travels on submarine cables or satellite connections that are run by companies that are incorporated in countries and therefore governed by their, in other words, there is no commons in cyber. And there is no part of the architecture that is outside the bounds of, of traditional sovereignty. And the Chinese and many countries around the world are pushing this view. Uh, and again, the US is alone in arguing that there are, uh, there are aspects of this in which the traditional state sovereignty view is not appropriate. Um, we are fighting with them because they've said publicly that they don't believe the laws of armed conflict apply in cyber, which is a fundamental showstopper for <laughs> OSD and people in the department. Um, and we can't feel like we feel like we can't get them back to the table to talk about other issues until we settle this philosophical one. And then finally, um, given that the, there has never been as an unbelievably successful an intelligence collection program on the Chinese side as this, it's basically ultra uh, for them. And they've become addicted to it. And given that, how do you then change the cost-benefit calculus um, of their view of this program, particularly if we've told them now over and over again it's bleeding into other aspects of the bilateral relationship? Um, and we're finding that we don't have a lot of tools. And we can talk more about that. But there are some good ideas on the table in terms of norms development and other things uh, that might change their view. So let me stop there. Thank you for your attention. These are uh, two hard acts to follow. Wow. Um, it, it's an honor for me to be here and be uh, asked to uh, discuss one of my favorite subjects, a relatively new subject. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, speaking here uh, together with uh, esteemed uh, fellow panel members. So uh, thank you very much. And it's a great, uh, great subject and great to be here. But what I'll do is, I'll, I'll, in my remarks, what I'll, do, I'll focus on uh, one particular issue. Uh, James um, and Bill as well uh, raised some really uh, very pertinent points. And what I'll, I'll focus on is, is one issue I think is particularly relevant, which is how do we change China's behavior? 
um, my perspective, um, and I'm relatively new to the cyber field. Actually, it wasn't until last year that I really became, looked into the issue in a bit more detail. My, my background tends to be in aerospace, uh, air and space, uh, mostly aerospace uh, arena, particularly space and uh, missiles. And, and some command control communications, uh, computers, intelligence, surveillance, or cloud or C for ISR architecture, but mostly from a command and control uh, and from a, a signals intelligence perspective. And that's a, a segue to, to what led me into sort of the cyber realm, which is I just got curious one day last year, so in the spring, we had a, a bet with somebody who worked in our uh, institute, uh, Ian Easton, who's now with the uh, Center for Naval Analysis. Whereas he was, we we're focused on space issues, satellite issues, and he was claiming that, that basically we ran across, what we, with some degree of confidence, what we felt is, uh, is are satellites that are, that are being launched uh, that have the ability to be able to monitor electronic emissions from uh, U.S. military forces uh, in the region, for example, sh uh, ships, electronic intelligence uh, satellites. And we'll have a bet on who, who, who's, who, who's in control, who, has, who manages the ground stations, who submitted the operational requirements. Uh, he was saying third department, I was saying fourth department. And of course, I, I wasn't 100% sure, but I had to do research to figure out, well, okay, who, which one's more likely. And in order to do this, you had to break out the whole general staff department. Um, and Bill mentioned the, uh, uh, the um, obsession the Chinese have with uh, numbers, numerology. And one of the good things for those of us in the analytical, uh, uh, in the analytical field is that the Chinese actually do make things somewhat, a little bit easier because of their reliance on numbers, particularly what's called military unit cover designators, or MUCDs. And that there's some logic to a lot of the People's Liberation Army structure and use of their military unit cover designators because they seem to be regiment level and above, and you can use this sort of as a way to get a general, sort of create a map of the uh, sort of organizational map and to me, to be able to get in and sort of really look at the answer on how do we change China's behavior, an initial question is asked is who's responsible? And that's where I'll focus my, my remarks here. Let's start off with sort of bottom line up front. My, 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 uh, my thesis is that when it comes to the PLA, that the General Staff Department, third department, rough counterpart of our uh, National Security Agency, uh, plays a leading role, if not central role, uh, in almost all, in, in all three major aspects of computer network operations, both on the exploitation side or, or, or cyber espionage, all the way to the uh, computer network defense side uh, or information security, um, and at least a, a significant supporting role for computer network attack. And I'll get in on uh, the computer network attack, I'll, I'll, I'll put aside uh, for the time being. But starting off at the policy level, one of the key questions that I've, uh, I've been asking and, and looking into is, with all this, uh, all these attempts going in to be able to break into our networks, me, for example, I've been, I don't know how many phishing attempts I get uh, that I've got ever since March 2008, so I came back after living in Taiwan for a few years, just a, a, a lot. And it's curious, I mean, somebody somewhere at a very senior level had to at least give an implicit, an, an implicit okay to be able to go after a lot of American networks, because there were significant political implications for doing this. Somebody somewhere at least had to give an implicit okay. And so the first question I ask is at what level and what organization? Um, and I've boiled it down to two at least tentative theories and sort of love, pose a question, sort of exercise a product to see if I can sort of pose initial questions is, is which organization could it be? And these are just two options. One, and, and the reason why this, uh, uh, this question is and the answer are important is that when you want to get to the idea of, of how do you change China's behavior, uh, an organization who's responsible can, can give you an idea of what drives them. Why are they doing this? You can, you can say they're just doing it to be able to leapfrog in technology, um, but which organization at the very senior level uh, gave an implicit instruction to, to me is fairly important. One option is the Central Committee, uh, Political Bureau, or more to be more precise, Central Committee General Office. Um, one particular organization that I've been infatuated with is, is a cryptologic management. Uh, leading group, headed by the director of the general office within the, within the central committee. Um, he's very close to Hu Jintao for, I mean, he, he's, uh, he was a, a, a staff, he's been a staff and attached to the hip, uh, Hu Jintao uh, for, for many, many years, of course, secretary general of the Chinese Communist Party. And um, if it is this organization, why, why do I say crypto? The only reason is that when you look at the organization underneath the crypto, third department is uh, crypto management, uh, uh, it has four different titles. One of them is the leading group, leading group office. Uh, they call it a confidential bureau. Uh, there, there's a, a standing committee that looks at this. And when you look at the members of these organizations within this crypto management office, and go down and look at their chain of command and their sponsorship of an organization in Shanghai, for example, 
and these names run together, but it's an information security engineering, uh, engineering center uh, that's in Shanghai uh, that I'd be able, be able to trace back and is very linked with the second bureau of the third department. But, um, but th they play a critical role in approval uh, of, and, and the linkages are significant throughout the bureaucracy of people that look at information security. Other organizations, state council, state organization. One is party, one is state. Um, James mentioned the informatization, uh, informatization leading group, state informatization leading group, and under them the information, computer and information security uh, uh, committee. This is another organization that has very high powered players here, uh, from both the civilian and the, uh, the military side. But when you look down from them, when you look at, for example, the center that they have and the organizational structure beneath them, uh, it, it's um, MII, Ministry of Information, uh, uh, Ministry of Information Industry. Uh, and very, very involved, of course, in what the, the great firewall of China. Um, and uh, so just sort of pose these two, still working on this one, um, in terms of at the very senior levels, which one appears to have some cognizance over the, the entire span of, uh, uh, computer, at a minimum, computer network, uh, computer network at, uh, or cyber espionage. And going down to the third department, uh, down one level, third department, of course, being under the general staff department, which is the, it's, it's difficult to make exact um, uh, analogies, but roughly joint staff, um, third department being National Security Agency, and it is a very broad, uh, uh, very very broad uh, organization, a very large organization. Now, why why would I make an assertion, or at least a hypothesis, that third department plays a central role? Well, number one, uh, th th for three reasons. Uh, number one, they when it, they have the at least what they themselves and what others claim the most advanced and historic. Uh, computing, advanced computing uh, research uh, organization, the 56 Research Institute in Wuxi, um, which they claim to have sort of the, the, the supercomputers and a lot of the advanced computing, parallel computing, cloud computing, things like this. Uh, and of course, when it comes to uh, uh, signals intelligence and break, making and breaking codes, uh, computing power uh, is, is significant, particularly to be able to do it fast. The second reason is when it comes to crypto. Now, a lot of organizations in, in China uh, make codes and, and, well, at least make codes. But when it comes to breaking codes, uh, the central organization is the third department, 58th Research Institute in, uh, in the area of Chengdu, or at Tetan Minyang, just north of there. Uh, of course, cryptology is, is, is critical when it comes to, uh, when you look at breaking passwords and breaking into systems, um, uh, it, it seems to me to play a fairly significant role. Other organizations are responsible for, for crypto, uh, for example, um, uh, securing your own communications. But when it comes to uh, breaking codes, uh, the third department is a key organization that, that could have an application to computer network uh, or cyber espionage. Third reason is, when you look at the scale of what's uh, being done in terms of breaking into our computer systems, uh, a lot of information is contained on one, one, just one computer. You, you can down and you steal files. You can, there's just so much information there. And it's going to be in English in terms of the United States. That, that, in order to be able to make, turn that information, that raw data, into uh, uh, useful intelligence for whoever it would be in, in China it required stuff uh, it would seem like it would require a massive translation uh, basically an uh, uh, army of, of translators and the organization within China that has the largest number of English qualified uh, linguists they're able to do the translation uh, in other languages as well Japanese Russian uh, would be the third department again just like our national security agency uh, they, they manage the their PLA Foreign Languages Institute, rough equivalent to Monterey uh, Defense Language Institute. Um, and it, it's, it is a huge reservoir of people that theoretically could be the ones to actually do a lot of the translation and reporting of their chain for dissemination throughout the rest of the uh, uh, People's Liberation Army and other, other consumers. Um, it, in terms of organization, the third department itself beyond these research institutes, um, I get the, uh, our uh, organization published a, a product on this um, last, uh, last November let that speak by itself, but it's broken up into bureaus, uh, generally. Uh, a bureau would be like a, back in the old days with NSA, you'd have A group and B group and things like that. But these bureaus uh, have, uh, appear to have functional responsibilities. Some appear to have sort of regional responsibilities. And other ones appear to have, for example, computer network defense responsibilities. Uh, what's mo most interesting, though, is when it comes to computer network defense and, and encryption and things like this, uh, Chengdu appears to be, or Sichuan, Chengdu appears to be a major uh, sort of cluster of organizations that, that, are, uh, that have um, a lot of competency in this area. Shanghai, Second Bureau, they're the ones that have a lot of the English linguists, but they're also the ones, for example, that have a, one of their uh, offices uh, that's co-located, for example, with China Telecom. Uh, there's one sort of uh, a center in Shanghai, northern part of Shanghai, where ostensibly all cables come in and out. It's also an uh, internet monitoring organization. Um, 
and uh, they call it the 005, actually they call it internet monitoring, 005 internet monitoring substation. Um, and third department, uh, very much in there. Um, but, uh, and then you also have other ones, like First Bureau, for example. Um, but it's not just third department. You've also heard the term Technical Reconnaissance Bureau. A Technical Reconnaissance Bureau, by strict definition, would be an organizational structure that would either be subordinate to military regions or their, uh, or their Air Force, Navy, as well as Second Artillery. And the Second Artillery one is fairly new, and I'll get to that in a minute. But each military region has their own rough, a, a, a rough equivalent to a third department responsible for signals intelligence, and at least based on publications, do a lot of research into, for example, how to break into MSN or, or Skype and, and other of these these sorts of things, and um, how to deal with uh, um, uh, uh, remote access, remote administration tools, and things like this um, at, at the technical reconnaissance bureau. Um, at, at, at that level, the military region level, uh, Air Force has their own a very large organization as well. Uh, so it's a very very large uh, bureaucracy, very very large uh, infrastructure for, uh, at a minimum, cyber espionage, or to put it another, put it another way, uh, intelligence preparation in the battlefield. But that leads to the, la the, the last issue that I'll, I'll raise, uh, and, and more of a question, um, and that's on the computer network attack side. Um, the, the lexicon can be important, because uh, whenever I think attack, I think of somebody doing something really, really malicious, like taking down my, my computer, or taking down networks. Uh, in, in, the, um, um, in, in the old days, we would call it electronic countermeasures, jamming. Uh, you got the collection side, then you got the jamming side. Organizationally, who in China would have, theoretically, this computer network attack capability and a contingency? The general view, and I can understand why uh, analysts would come to the conclusion, would be the general staff department, fourth department. And this is getting way down the weeds, but there, there's a reason so in terms of thinking about the organization that can give an idea on, on, on at least how they would approach in a conflict, how they would approach doing things and, and why they do things the way they do. Fourth department, traditionally, jamming. Electronic, uh, electronic countermeasures. The, the, matter of fact, it's called the Radar and Electronic Countermeasures Department. Um, and back in the, they, they, they produced, at least authors like Dai Chimin that you mentioned, produced a lot of studies on what they call uh, network electronic integration. Um, uh, so for this kind of type of warfare. And it would lead one to, to the assumption that, okay, since they're producing a lot of writings on, on this issue, that they may have that CNA function. And maybe the third department has the uh, S, uh, cyber espionage or computer network exploitation, as well as computer network defense, at least for the PLA. And the fourth department have this. But when you look at uh, how they tend to do things, uh, the fourth department, equivalent to joint staff, electronic warfare, traditionally has been responsible at the operational level in terms of electronic warfare. At the tactical level, in other words, battalion, for example, a, a jamming battalion level communications. Probably is going to be further down in the chain, but in terms of going after links between, for example, a theater commander, a joint task force commander, down to a, uh, down to a fleet or down to a, down to a wing, in terms of jamming that communications. Um, the prob prob probably for department. But when it comes to strategic network attack, when I say strategic, meaning going after the United States nuclear command and control. When I say going after the United States uh, critical infrastructure here in the U.S., would the fourth department have this responsibility if their if their core competency has been sort of down at, at the sort of the operational level and below, or uh, do they have the necessary tools and and background in doing nodal analysis? In other words, being able to figure out if they take this particular node out, what the ripple effects are. For example, what sort of cascading effects would have, what second order effects, what third order effects would taking something out have. And the organization, to me, that, that has traditionally that traditionally has had this core competency is, is not even within GSD, but it's their strategic strike organization, which is Second Artillery. Second Artillery, which is their equivalent, rough equivalent of U.S. Strategic Command. So could it be that Second Artillery could have sort of a strategic computer network attack in, in their portfolio that could be recently adopted? And what we saw from Fourth Department, maybe back in 2002 to 2006 time frame, maybe an advocacy being uh, 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 proposed by fourth department in order to gain that particular portfolio, to gain that mission. Because you know, every organization, bureaucracy, sort of would like to have more responsibility. Um, and, and that certainly has been the way with, the, for example, the PLA Air Force, when they go in with, with using similar terminology by saying what they call Kontianiti, or, uh, or, or air space integration, in order to be able to maintain that space portfolio, sort of grab that space mission, for example, management of satellites and things like this. Um, it, it, I'm not sure if the uh, PLA Air Force has won that battle. And likewise, on the fourth department side, when it comes to computer network attack, could they have this mission of strategic computer network attack? Maybe. It's certainly worth looking into. Um, is there other indications within their organizational structure, the first bureau, second bureau, third bureau, that would indicate a computer network attack mission? I, I haven't seen it yet. 
Um, second, second artillery in terms of Peter network attack, maybe. Um, just things are starting to come out in terms of, like, for example, an internal book that was published in 2004 about them adopting a computer network operations. They use the term CNO, which is more broad, uh, broadly defined. Uh, or why would the former director of third department, uh, why would he go over to become the deputy commander of the second artillery? A third department guy, the guy who's been doing it all of his life. He's a Russian linguist, grew up in this community for 30 years. Why suddenly did he become the third, second, second artillery sec, uh, deputy commander? It, it could make some sense if you've got a strategic network a, a, a attack mission that you have somebody in there that can provide better integration and better jointness uh, and sort of seamless operations with uh, the guys that do the uh, intel preparation of the battlefield. And then thirdly, why, why possibly second artillery? Um, again, there may be lots of these organizations springing up at the Second Artillery Engineering Academy in Xi'an, uh, Computer Network Warfare uh, Operations Center uh, in terms of research and development and things like this. So these are just still sort of the preliminary thesis phase. Um, and um, so that's sort of a fire hose, hose approach, uh, more details. Uh, nitty gritty details um, in terms of organization of third department and the product we did last November. And, and again, thank you very much for this opportunity. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be here. Thank you. Well, thanks to all our three guests. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll try and abbreviate what I have to say. I'm not a Chinese cyber expert. I know a little bit about cyber. I know uh, a little bit about Russia. And uh, I know a little bit about what we're trying to do in the United States. So I thought I'd try to draw this together, so what does it mean when you look at it and make a few observations? I've got four. Um, one is uh, I'm very impressed with the, uh, the theoretical basis for what the Chinese do. Uh, very much a different approach. As uh, we uh, say in our Russia presentation, you know, there is a very different way of looking at things in Russia and obviously in China. Uh, very theoretical. You do the theory first, then you try to do things. We in America tend to be more doers. What's our objective? What are the steps to do that? And then we write the theory later. Um, I'm also impressed uh, on, on some of the parallels between Russia and China. Uh, the, the theoretical development uh, that's there uh, the work that was done, particularly in the 90s, uh, long before we were thinking in theoretical ways about cyber, uh, we're wrestling with all those concepts now. Uh, look at some of the things that you see talked about in the press, you know, things coming out of the Pentagon, what should we be doing, what should we not be doing. Take uh, uh, Deputy Secretary Bill Lin's article, uh, what, does, what exactly does active defense mean? I mean? Does that mean offense? What should NSA be doing? What should, who should be doing what? These are things that the Chinese and the Russians really kind of settled back in the 90s. Who should be doing what, how they should be doing it, what they should do, what they shouldn't do. Uh, those kinds of things were all there. Um, I'm impressed by uh, just, just one thing I, I, I got from Bill's book. Um, if you ask them sort of what are, what are the principles, they'll give you a list, omnidirectionality, synchrony, limited objectives, unlimited measures. And I think you even pointed out in your book that you chaired a, um, a seminar on this. And that there's the sort of on one side was the principles, the Chinese principles. And then you look on the Western side, and there really aren't any uh, comparable things there. Uh, and, and I think that's a, that's, that's a very interesting comment that, uh, that, that, they've, that they've sort of graduated uh, to that point. Um, the second thing I'd like to point out is, uh, of course, every presentation on China has to mention Sun Tzu. And uh, Bill uses Sun Tzu uh, extensively in his book. Uh, but I'd like to point out one of the things that didn't come out here is, what is what's the what is the, the title of the last chapter of Sun Tzu's book? The Use of Spies. Now, he's quite, you know, Want about it? Here it is. The use of spies. This is what you should be doing. Now, obviously, he's writing uh, 2,500 years ago, and uh, so he's not talking about cyber things. But the, but but the concept, the idea that this is something that you do, everybody does it. You should do it well. Uh, you should be trying to gather information. You should be trying to spread disinformation. You should be wary of disinformation that someone's trying to spread to you. I mean, it's all there. And one of the things I love about Sun Tzu is he was very brief. I mean, you can get down, you can read The Use of Spies in, in about an hour. Uh, it's all there. He lays it out. Contrast that to sort of the Western approach. Now, come on, we all do it. But as late as 1929, we have somebody like Henry Stimson saying, gentlemen don't read other gentlemen's mail. And there was an organization in the State Department, by the way, at the time called MI8 uh, that was, in fact, 
a, the beginning of a spy agency, uh, Secretary Stimson abolished it because gentlemen don't read other gentlemen's mail. Um, now, I'm not saying that we weren't reading gentlemen's mail back in 1929. I give my guess is somebody somewhere where it was, um, and we certainly are doing it now. But there's sort of, I think there's, there's something to be said about the cultural approach uh, that in China, uh, we, it's very openly talked about. This is something that, that is done. This is how you, you ensure your victory, your survival. And in, in our country, there's sort of this, well, we don't know, talk about it really. Sort of, we're kind of bashful about it. And I think there's, there's something uh, that, that you get out of that when you, when you go in, into, into cyber. The third observation, somebody alluded to it, uh, was that uh, uh, there's a very broad approach to this. Uh, the roots of all of this, if you look at Chinese military doctrine, of course it's evolved from people's war, but there's elements of Sun Tzu in people's war, and there's still elements in the current doctrine uh, that of, of people's war. I mean, it's still there, that concept. And it seems to me it almost comes full circle. They abandoned people's war uh, because it wasn't quite working anymore. A bunch of you know peasants going out with, with rakes and, and, and shovels uh, probably was not something that was going to take them into the later part of the 20th century. But take a look at what's happening now. Under high-tech conditions, all of a sudden, you're talking about the people again. And I just wanted to read something uh, that, that Bill has in his book. And this is a quote from uh, Wei Zhang Chang, uh, who wrote a book called Information War, A New Form of People's War. Um, and uh, he says, the fact that information technology is increasingly relevant to people's lives determines that those who take part in information war are not all soldiers, and that anybody who understands computers may become a fighter <coughs> on the network. Think tanks composed of non-governmental experts may take part in decision making. Rapid mobilization will not just be directed to young people. Information-related industries and domains will be the first to be mobilized and enter the war. And that's a very, very broad approach. We're not talking about a cyber command with a bunch of guys sitting there with uniforms in a basement and big screens somewhere. Uh, he's talking about a people's war, essentially a high-tech, well-educated people's war where the state relies on the resources. And those resources may be working for some government agency. They may be working in a uh, state-owned enterprise. They may be working in a private enterprise. They may be criminals. They may be in youth groups. They may be in universities. They may be lots of people. But they're people out there with skills. And, uh, and this is a people's war. These people can be mobilized. And I think that's also a very big contrast to the way we look at, uh, at, at those kinds of things. Um, and then finally, I wanted to point out uh, that uh, th that part of that broad base is the is 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 corporate entities, and it seems to me this is another major major difference between the way we look at things and the way they look at things. Uh, I keep hearing from uh, a lot of American leaders, people who write about it, uh, people in government, out of government. You know, w are we expecting a cyber Pearl Harbor? And it seems to me that that's the wrong question. If you listen to what, what Bill, and James, and Mark are talking about, is uh, we're not looking for a, 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 a cyber Pearl Harbor. We're looking for something that is already going on. And if you look at corporate entities that are, are involved in this, what are they doing? They're basically out there looking. Yeah, they're cracking into the Pentagon and the CIA and you know the obvious places. But they're also trying to get uh, into uh, American defense contractors. Uh, there was uh, one hack uh, uh, about a year ago, I think, Lockheed Martin L3. Uh, there was a series. I think the first, the first issue was they'd gotten into RSA, stolen the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the code there at, at, at RSA. And, and then the next question is, well, if you break into a locksmith shop, why did you do it? Probably steal the key to something else. And, um, and, and, and they're looking at that. And I think James then mentioned that one of the turning points was when they started not just uh, trying to break into the obvious military stuff, but were really breaking into just about any form of valuable intellectual property 
uh, that the Americans have. Well, now, why do you do that? Well, obviously, the, on the first level, there's, there's greed. If you run a company, even if it's a state-owned enterprise, there's some money that goes in your pocket. If you can steal some good stuff without paying for it and then market it, uh, you make some money. And you're in business because the state allows you to be in business in China. So, I mean, but you still make money. There's a personal gain there. But it seems to me there's also a national strategy here to advance China uh, at some point to uh, basically first eat our lunch and uh, then to gradually become the equal of the United States. I don't think there's going to be a Pearl Harbor. I don't think the Chinese want a Pearl Harbor. Uh, they do not want us to leave the Western Pacific. Uh, th that would be a, a geopolitical disaster for China. Uh, they do not want to face the Japanese without some kind of American intervention and various other, you know, there's all sorts of conflicts in, in, uh, in Asia that, that they kind of want the Americans there. What they want to do is they want to be able to control the how and the why and the whens of the American involvement. They don't want the Americans doing anything they don't really want them to do. They certainly don't want the Americans getting involved in anything that they're involved in. And that is why you get the kinds of things that Mark has been documenting for, oh, it's been 20 years now, hasn't it, Mark? Uh, um, but when you start talking about a, uh, a precision, uh, strike, a precision strike, strike complex, being able to target American ships at sea, these kinds of things, um, this is the kind of thing that kind of keeps the U.S. Navy out of your business. I don't think there's sort of a, let's, there's no Pearl Harbor attack, let's go destroy the United States Navy. It's, it's a, we want to make sure that we control the terms of its, of its engagement here. Uh, secondly, our economy. Uh, you keep reading these horror stories, they're going to bring down the American stock market. I don't think they're going to do such, any such thing. Um, uh, who's going to buy their televisions and their refrigerators and their computers, by the way, because of all the computers we're sitting there, uh, there um, are made in China. The Air Force was about to buy, they finally backed down, they were going to buy, repla their, replace their flight bags with iPads. Uh, and I mean, believe it or not, uh, the Air Force was actually going to buy uh, iPads uh, for hardware, and they were going to put uh, Russian-written software uh, on it. Uh, this is what were, our pilots are going to be carrying in their, in their aircraft. Um, and they finally got pushed, pushed off, off to the side. But it seems to me that we need to start thinking about that, the kinds of things that can be done. And yes, a lot of it is ones and o's, and somebody in the back pointed out correctly that if you know what you're looking for and if it's in the code, uh, you know, that, that, that you can probably find it. If you have the time and the resources and you know what you're looking for, uh, if it is in everything out there that everyone is using, that's going to be a really tall order to do. Secondly, it could be in the firmware, and that is a lot harder to find than something that's in the code. So it seems to me that we need to start thinking about all of those things. Don't wait for a Pearl Harbor, folks. I think it's already happening. Uh, we need to wake up here. And uh, I agree also uh, with Bill. I don't know China as he does. But uh, I've been to China several times. I actually kind of like China. I like Chinese people. Um, don't want to fight with China. Don't want to do China bashing. On the other hand, I think we do need to start to get this straight. This has something to do uh, with the survival of our country and us going forward with our way of life. And I think we need to take a look at that. I'd like to uh, thank all three of us, uh, of our uh, participants. Uh, I hope I didn't talk too long. And we do have a little bit of time left, so uh, we can continue the Q&A and comment uh, from the audience. And I welcome your participation as well. So thank you very much. So um, let's see. If you could just identify yourself. And uh, was it something I said? Uh, uh, <laughs> um, and, um, and, and I'll try and call in, try and if you want to address your question to one of the members of the panel or, or, or all of them, that's fine. And try and keep your questions brief so we can accommodate everybody, Kai. Thanks. Uh, uh, Kai DeVoice, uh, question really for, for Mark and, and, and James. Uh, you made the comment about the switch from the intelligent preparation of the battlefield to what we used to call corporate espionage type, type of collection. Uh, who would have made that decision at what level in China? Well, I mean, well, first of all, I, I think you have to take into account the demo. That's yeah. just for the TV yeah. crew. Yeah. Can we use this? Um, absolutely. Can we use this thing? Uh, the, um, there's an element of decentralization to this that's important. <coughs> I think I think that we often assume a monolith on the Chinese side in terms of behavior 
because of an absence of data. Mm -hmm. um, we have an enormous number of actors on the Chinese side, whether it's three PLA technical reconnaissance bureaus, elements of the Ministry of State Security, and then a gray and white hat hacker culture that is um, embedded very deeply with the ministries of public security and state security. Um, and so there is an element of, in, in my view, just based on what we see in terms of what we're, we're looking at on the Chinese side, uh, in some cases people develop accesses, develop tools, uh, acquire content, and then go looking for people who might care about it. Um, you can't discount, it, you, know, as a, as, you know, as a signer, you can't discount that there's a tremendous amount of material that's on the SIGINT room cutting floor uh, that is in standalone databases that are not widely shared. I mean, I think that one of the unicorns we're chasing right now is to what extent, if we understand these stovepipes of this 2 PLA and its efforts, and 3 PLA and 4 PLA and the MSS and everybody else, we have no confidence that there's horizontal sharing going on, okay? I mean. Just, you know, again, we shouldn't project a monolith onto China and say in the absence of data, we assume that they're just completely coordinated and strategic and everything else. In fact, every single time we've lifted the lid on a Chinese policy making process, it's more bloody, more internecine, more backstabbing uh, than we ever could possibly have thought. And the reason why? Because in the Chinese system, the organization chart is the opening bargaining position. You also, you know, whereas in our system, the org chart actually means something. In the Chinese system, you also have to understand these overlapping Venn diagrams of informal relationships. Who went to school together? Who's married to whom? You know, who grew up together? Who went to, went to what Beijing primary school together? You know, whose father knew who? Whose mother knew whom? And that, you know, that really tells you, you have to develop that map anytime you deal with any Chinese organization, understand who has real power and real influence. And so the idea that we can just simply look at the Chinese military org chart and say, well, they're both under the general staff department, therefore they must share data. Well, you know, I've spent a lot of time dealing with NSA. <laughs> you know, so the assumption that SIGINT organizations freely share data, uh, to me, is fundamentally flawed. Uh, and I don't, and I think we have to, we have to understand the same bureaucratic mindset, may in fact be even more distorted and perverse. So there could be, and, and let me just point out also that I have found deep intrusions in my own networks that were exfiltrating data while somebody else was continuing to bang on my network overtly with more spear phishing. Well, why would they do that? All they did was alert us to the fact that we needed to look deeper for potentially what was going on. Clearly, there were two, three, four, five different sets of actors independently targeting our networks. And the loud noises of one alerted us to the quiet activities of the other. In, you know, in our system, frankly, there's a lot better coordination because, because of the sensitivity and the secrecy and everything else. And so um, I, I think rather we, we certainly go into the discussions with the Chinese leadership and say, um, this is now bled over into other parts of the bilateral relationship. You need to reach down in your system and restore an element of discipline and control to what's going on. Even put in place a Moscow rules in cyber espionage that both sides can adhere to. Uh, but I think that's based on the idea that in fact at the bottom level it's much more distributed uh, much more independent than we would like to believe, um, uh, and therefore much more difficult to deal with as a policy challenge. Okay, we've got this gentleman and the gentleman in the back. Amy, did you have a question? I did. Okay, so one, two, three. Sir. Oh, so I don't need my car. I usually don't anyway. Um, Colin Clark, AWOL Defense. Uh, if you're the Chinese, are you happy or sad with the move by NSA? I see and other elements, of the federal government to the cloud. Well, I'm, 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 you know, I will admit I, I do have some technical background, but I certainly would never claim to be a technical person. I think that one of the trends, you know, if we always, if we, if we start with the premise that we have a fundamentally flawed architecture that we've been gluing security on the side of ever since. And, and this is something that is said by the architects of the original architecture. It was never designed for security. They never thought anybody was going to do anything malicious with it. Um, I think that we have this constant push-pull of, um, in particular in the last couple of years, this push towards connectivity with security as an afterthought. Um, and in particular, the move to social media and to mobile uh, and to cloud to the point where many of us don't even know actually that we're in a cloud when we're actually in a cloud. 
And you say, well, you know, you know, I mean, I understand the thin client argument, which says, you know, right now the system is designed so that we trust the core, but we can't trust the edge, right? And it's my mother's fault. This is a Mother's Day message, right? It's my mother's <laughs> fault that the internet is insecure because she's not smart enough to configure Windows Vista properly, right? And so her machine becomes a zombie in an East European botnet that is stealing money from Citibank. Right, and it's all my mother's fault, right? It's not Microsoft's fault, it's not anybody else's fault, it's my mother's fault, because we can't trust the edge, right? So let's take all that away from my mother. Let's only give my mother a thin client, and then let's let the brainiacs up in the cloud manage the security enterprise infrastructure, and they'll do the proper patching, and they'll, you know, they'll be able to monitor it all the time. I mean, I understand the model, it's a good model, particularly given that I have a lot of analysts working for me who are constantly doing stupid things on, on the network and, and creating vulnerabilities. But at the same time, I don't believe that the cloud industry has done enough to actually assure me as a CISO of my company that they are actually securing the cloud. And I'll just give you a good example, right? Google, you know, the smartest guys in the world. You, you know this because they tell you all the time. Uh, and you know, but they were so smart, right? But in Aurora, the Chinese got in the Google cloud. They got into the Google uh, system that was used to support FISA and FAA wiretapping requests from the US government and just raped them. So if Google can't defend its cloud, so why am I supposed to trust people who tell me that the security solution is the cloud? Now, the industry may be making progress on that front, but they've certainly done a terrible job of convincing people like me that we're moving in the right direction. So, you know, maybe it's a PR problem, but I doubt it. Thank you. Could I just ask everybody, just please, we, a lot of us know each other, but not everybody knows everybody, so just tell everybody who you are. Sir. Uh, Paul Kazunchak, DARPA. Uh, so we've been going for almost two hours, and there are sort of several phrases that haven't been used. Let me see if I can get you to talk about the role of information in political warfare. Um, uh, you haven't mentioned Tiananmen Square. You didn't mention any lessons learned from uh, Russian operations and cyber operations in Estonia. Uh, have the Chinese ever talked about Goebbels? Uh, first thing Lenin did when the Bolsheviks took over was to create a party to overthrow the Bolshevik party so he'd have all his enemies in one place. What do we see? Any Chinese comments on any of these issues? Well, I, I will say that one thing that, that, we, that I, I failed to mention earlier is I find an interesting cleavage between the U.S. and, the, and China on these issues uh, has to do with, with sort of the, the global political sphere in the sense that um, I think the Chinese view, the Chinese and the Russians are clearly much more comfortable with cyber as an overt tool of national power than we are. Thank you. Um, they are, you know, we see this in Estonia and Russia. We see this with the Chinese complicity with patriotic hacking, you know, passive versus an active complicity. And the idea is, is that not only are they comfortable with an overt tool, you know, with the barest fig leaf of covering of state involvement, but they're also comfortable with the use of proxies, even in the Russian case, non-national proxies. And, and those of you who have ever dealt with the people up in the research and engineering building up before me, the idea that somehow the US government would authorize non-national proxies to carry out strategic level cyber attacks on behalf of the US government, that it potentially have strategic level consequences against a nuclear armed adversary is ludicrous. And yet when we deal with the Chinese and the Russians, clearly there's a much greater risk acceptance in that realm. Um, and that is a fundamental form of political warfare in the extent to which you shape other countries' thinking about your risk acceptance at the strategic level for behavior. Thank you. Sir, um, my name is Amy Kutru, CSFI. Um, my question was, uh, you mentioned that the Chinese are afraid of being invaded because of their past history. If that is so, uh, what are they trying to do? What are they trying to prove? Or what kind of message are they trying to send out by trying to invade others constantly with their cyber activity? Uh, are they, is it a message to the United States about what they're capable of? Well, I, I brushed briefly on it. But I mean, if you look at historically at what has happened to the Chinese in the physical world, they do not want history to repeat itself in the Middle Kingdom. You look at the Beijing legations, you look at what the Japanese did prior to World War II, you look at what the Japanese did during World War II. Even look back at the early 20th century or middle 20th century with the special economic trade development zones that were developed in some of the big cities such as Guangzhou, Shanghai, Beijing, Tianjin. That was the beginning of what they perceived to be another invasion of foreigners. 
And as I mentioned, they do not like anyone that is not Chinese. So they know, as I briefly mentioned, I apologize, I did not do a good enough job, but their military is not yet developed enough to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with us. But they do know that if, and if you look at that NGC report that came out, if they can achieve that first mover advantage in cyberspace and deny access to the tip fit, so Marines or airmen or soldiers are messed up in their deployment cycle, then they've essentially achieved control of that battlefield. And once you've achieved that and diverted the forces that were going, say, to Taiwan, to South Korea, you have that geopolitical or strategic advantage over them. And that's where they want to have that demonstrable advantage. Once, however, once their military does become on parity with ours, which I don't know that that will necessarily happen because their NCO Corps is so horrid, then we should, you should really be aware. But I don't think, as Ambassador Smith said, we're going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. They don't want it. We don't want it. What would be the point? Mutually assured destruction, for sure. Hopefully that answer your question, ma'am? Yes. Okay. Mark. I'm just, I'm just off just one other alternative explanation or augmenting a, a, a theory. And, and that's uh, the, 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 the Chinese government, yes, a lot of paranoia uh, in there in terms of in, in historical legacies that, that feed into the, this, this sort of paranoia. But there's one other thing I think that there's, why, why I tend to sort of differentiate between the party and the state. Um, one theory is that, and, and why there could be a connection between the domestic internet monitoring, for example, the, the, the Great Firewall of China, is that one theory is that it began with concerns that people within the party, senior leadership of the party, would have over the, the threats, would, would they perceive to be threats to the party's monopoly on power um, over the state. Uh, bear in mind that it's CCP first, kind of Chinese Communist Party, and their whole goal is to develop the state. It, 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 rather than being a state and then parties operating within that, it's actually party and then the whole goal is to really develop a state around it, the nation. Um, and, and territorial integrity and sovereignty are, are key concerns of actually the state, the state side. But on the party side, uh, the, 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 the prominent concern is what they perceive to be threats to the Chinese Communist Party. And so just with that, add that in, sort of the concerns of the party, because if they are very paranoid about threats to the party, then that would lead to things like the Great Firewall. For their first concern would be to find threats to the party, people to question the authority uh, in, in a very coordinated way. And just you know, one, one question I would have is, could that have extended, again, with the idea of there's no sovereign boundaries, uh, could that have extended and others that began with perceived threats to the party from the outside, whether it's dissident groups or whether it's, uh, for example, the, uh, the, to me, a, a big major target is Taiwan, of course, and Taiwan actually is not necessarily, a, they call it a, a sovereignty issue, but Actually, Taiwan is a, it's, it, it's a, it's a political core. It's a core interest, and the, pre, and, and the root of that actually has to do with an old uh, Taiwan is a democracy. It's a Chinese society that actually poses an existential threat to the Chinese Communist Party in, in terms of the population. So that would be a natural threat, and that leads into the other issue in terms of targeting here in Washington. Taiwan uh, organizations involved in Taiwan here are top priority, foremost in the bigger FAPA uh, Promotion Association of Public Affairs, U.S. Taiwan Business Council, and other uh, think tanks. Uh, Seem to be huge problems, your organization and others. Um, and so I just put that party on in there as well, uh, in addition to just concern, general concerns over territorial integrity and sovereignty. Right. But, but to, to get to your point, though, that on, on double standards, which is to say, I, I've seen across all the strategic realms, nuclear space and cyber, um, a continuing belief by the Chinese side uh, that they are at an asymmetric disadvantage mm -hmm. and that the, uh, the high-tech entity is asymmetrically vulnerable. Right? And in fact, what's interesting to me is, I think in all three of those realms, the Chinese are very quickly, and there's a good RAND word, are asymptotically um, uh, becoming status quo powers in all three of those domains, but not seeing it. And there's an interesting perceptual blind spot where in the nuclear and cyber and space dialogues, we're saying to them, look, you just put up dozens of satellites and you're integrating them into your operations. Um, you know, developing any satellite weapons was a terrible idea. You know, you should fear other people who are revisionist, you know, asymmetric powers in this space because now you have as much to lose up there as we do. Uh, on the cyber side, this is an asymmetric capability where the U.S. is asymmetrically vulnerable. Taiwan is asymmetrically vulnerable. In fact, China every day is becoming more and more of a wired society, and the military is integrating um, computer systems into everything that they're doing. 
And so they're becoming a status quo power in that space with as much to fear from WikiLeaks and all of the sort of anti-status quo uh, actors as anybody else. And the same is on, same on the nuclear side, where they may say they have a recessed minimal deterrent and a no first juice policy, but they're, you know, I really believe that this, that this, and I've been telling people all over town, we need to think about a universe three or four years out where the Chinese leadership realizes that simply through technological development inertia, they wake up and realize they've got a, they've actually got a limited war fighting force. And there's the technological push-pull that says, hey, wait a minute, we need to now revise all of our doctrine and conceptual thinking to take advantage of the fact that we now have this much larger force with strategic global warning and all this kind of stuff. And so this is a big uh, ideological dispute that we have with them during these meetings, you know, where we say, you know, you, you act as if you have no vulnerabilities. You act as if that, you know, that this could not rebound to the negative for you, and it's only a negative for us, and that's a fundamental misperception. And it really gets to the sort of Bob Jervis kind of arguments about how perceptions and misperceptions lead to conflict in international affairs. I've got a question back here. Then here, and you, sir, will have the last word. So first back here. Uh, Richard Lamagna, Trust Anchor. Uh, given the threat, what is our national architecture for a coordinated public-private, you know, government, private industry, defense yeah. Um, yeah. plan? <laughs> <laughs> All I can say, every, every meeting that I go to within the policy framework in the government, it, people are still arguing about who's in charge. They're arguing about authorities. They're arguing about authority boundaries, Title 10 versus Title 50, domestic versus international. Um, I have not seen any demonstrable progress in that discussion in three years. I mean, when, when the DASD for cyber comes out publicly and says that NSA does not have a domestic role, while General Alexander the day before said the exact opposite, you know we've got a problem. <laughs> Sir? Yeah. Um, just to go to your point, oh, I'm sorry, I thought it was very moving kind of English. Um, just to go to your point, another way that China is becoming similar to us is in the way that they're building out the cities. They have this uh, initiative, 20 cities every year for 20 years. I don't know if anybody's heard of this yet, but this is what they have. They're building into these cities um, ICS structures, okay, industrial control systems, right? This is where we are very vulnerable. We know it. And we've been this way for a while because, you know, we've had Honeywell thermostats for my lifetime, but now they're on the internet. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay. Smart grid. Right, actually, everything's smart, okay? So, yes, they can attack us on the infrastructure, but they're going the same direction. <coughs> yeah, I mean, in fact, the coin of the realm, when you read Chinese internal writings and when they're talking about the chat rooms, the coin of the realm now in cyber is Stuxnet. Right. And because that would be, in your mind, that was the Rubicon that was crossed, whereby you went from having a digital warfare with digital effects to digital warfare with physical effects. Okay? And of course, interestingly, you know, their logic for US attribution on Stuxnet was because of its design. In other words, it was designed to have limit collateral damage, uh, to only go after a certain centrifuge cascade with certain configuration in a certain place. Yeah, and otherwise, and otherwise it goes benign. And they say, well, what other, what military fights that way? What military spends a disproportionate amount of time in the chaos looking at the debris field? If you hit this corner of the building, is it going to hit the orphanage? Is it going to hit the hospital? You know, there's only one military in the world that does that. You know, therefore, QED Stuxnet must be. Um, and oh, so it's not as right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's good to have friends. <laughs> Sir, you have the last question. Hans Sass, uh, Georgetown University. You mentioned the war of the people tradition. One scenario, of course, is that the people, the peasants, support the mandarins and the emperor on the national agenda. But there is another tradition, the Limpiao uh, tradition. The village is fighting the cities, the right. poor fighting the rich. So what if the people uh, get angry with corrupt mandarins, princelings, even the emperor? Uh, what's the anticipation of this? China has, has traditions, used to have three kingdoms and even more. 
could it be in the future that, uh, that there will be not just one China? Yeah. We are all talking about today, China, China, China. Would there be various groups, big families, conglomerates of families, brother taking over more than three kingdoms? Would that be an, a, a, a real alternative for the second part of this century? And what are they doing? What, are they, what is the emperor doing about that? Yeah. When, when policy people ask me if I had unlimited authorities, what would I do to try and push back on the Chinese side and, and further our national interests, I say, I would set up a Chinese wiki. Because <laughs> <laughs> that will rip the system apart faster than it can. I'd like to uh, thank our three guests, and uh, on behalf of our CEO, Mike Stettman. I'd like to thank you for coming to Potomac Institute, for sharing your insight with us, and offer you these uh, Potomac Institute recognition coins, and thank you very much for coming, and thank all of you for coming today.